Hi everyone, welcome to the Business History Channel. I'm Kiran Kasbekar and today I'm going to talk about the sand crisis that has crept up on the world silently and insidiously and which is digging the way towards big, big catastrophes around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic, a once in a lifetime kind of event which had cornered the world's attention for two years running, has already set back growth besides causing more than six and a half million deaths around the world. Countries are still stumbling out of that crisis. Another very serious crisis is the water crisis. You must have heard about the water shortages people are facing in California in the US, in Cape Town in South Africa, in parts of India, in many Middle Eastern countries. So we are going through one crisis after another. But have you heard about the word sand crisis? Sand crisis? Why should there be a sand crisis? Isn't there enough sand all over the world? On seashores and lake shores, along rivers and in big and small deserts around the world? With so much sand around the world, why do we need to worry about a sand crisis? Well, we do. It's not a question of how much sand there is in the world. The question is what type of sand is available. And sand of the type that is used in many industrial applications, which we were accustomed to getting virtually free of cost, is becoming harder to find. The situation has become so bad that it has led to a new crime wave. There are sand mafias in many parts of the world that have been mining sand illegally from riverbeds, heedless of the damage that does to the environment. These mafias have become very powerful and enjoy political patronage. Voluntary organizations have opposed them, but there is so much money in sand that some of the sand mafias have ruthlessly murdered people who have opposed their illegal mining of sand. Most people would probably ask how something like sand can be precious when people walk all over it on sea beaches and river beaches. Think about it. If you ask a group of people to list the most important materials in the world, you can bet they'd say something like this. Steel, aluminium, copper, plastic, paper, cement, maybe silver and gold. And some smart ones would even include stuff like nickel, lead, carbon, uranium, and molybdenum. How many people would list sand in their list of important materials? My guess is none, or maybe one out of hundred or a thousand. If you then mention sand, a few people may raise their hands and say, oh yes, sand. It's used in the making of concrete, isn't it? Yes, it is used to make concrete and it is used to make glass too. And concrete and glass are two very important components of any modern building especially in the cities. Sand also goes into making concrete asphalt or tar roads. But these are not the only sectors that depend on sand. All devices that use semiconductor chips, for example, depend on sand as a basic raw material. Now semiconductors are used not only in computers and mobile phones, but in every electronic device we use and that works out to a very large number of things we use today. Here are a few examples cars and other vehicles, cameras, microwaves, water purifiers, washing machines, refrigerators, solar panels, hospital equipment, office equipment, scientific instruments, the list is endless. Sand is also used in the process of drilling for petroleum and gas. It is used in the hydraulic fracturing process, commonly known as fracking, that is used in the oil drilling business. With fracking, a mixture of sand and water is injected with great force into tight oil formations to break the shale rock and make it easier to extract the oil in the rock. And then you have stuff like toothpaste that use silicates. Surprised? Frankly, when I started doing my research on this video, I never expected to find toothpaste in the list of products that use stuff derived from sand. But some toothpaste do use what is called hydric hydrated silica. Sand is also used for land reclamation and for flood protection in coastal areas, prevention of erosion of the coasts and addressing climate change impacts such as the rise in sea levels. Some countries are using sand and rocks to reclaim land from the sea. These include Singapore, Hong Kong, the Philippines, China and the Netherlands. Talking of reclamation, I must say something here about what happened more than two centuries ago in the area now known as Bombay or Mumbai. I don't know how many of you know this. But Mumbai or Bombay as it came to be called afterwards 
was built on land largely reclaimed from the sea. Mumbai, named after Mumbai Devi, the goddess worshipped by the fisher folk who inhabited the island, was itself one of seven islands. The other six islands were called Kolaba, Little Kolaba, both to the south, and Mazgao, Warli, Parel, and Mahim to the north. These islands were separated by big stretches of the sea. In 1782, William Hornby assumed the office of Governor of Bombay and initiated the Hornby Vellard Engineering Project of uniting the seven islands into a single landmass. In 1784, the Hornby Vellard Project was completed and soon reclamation at Worli and Mahalakshmi followed. The word Vellard incidentally means fence in Portuguese, the colonists who controlled the Bombay Islands before the British took over. Perhaps they used that word because the area was fenced off or fortified. Two causeways were built to connect the now joined Bombay Islands to the mainland, one in the east at Sion and the other in the west at Mahim. Commuters today do not even realize that there was even an island there where South and Central Bombay are today, let alone seven islands. They must have used up a huge amount of sand, gravel and crushed stone brought in from the mainland. But do remember, Bombay was created a few centuries ago when the world did not face the kind of environmental problems it is facing today. You do find a few instances of countries trying to create land in the shallows of the sea by pouring large quantities of sand, gravel and crushed stone into the water. China and the UAE have created islands in the sea in recent times and Singapore is expanding its landmass by similarly reclaiming land from the sea. But these are rare examples of such territorial expansion. Anyway, landfills are a small part of sand usage today. A bulk of it is used in construction. According to McKinsey and Company, construction-related spending accounts for 13% of the world's GDP, and that includes concrete and glass, both of which use up large quantities of sand. Now take a look at this chart showing growth in the consumption of materials in the United States of America. The huge orange mountain you see here is crushed stone, sand and gravel, which is way more than the use of any other material. From agricultural and forest products, non-renewable -renew organics, primary metals, recycled metals, to industrial minerals, which means about everything else. Now see this chart, also about the US. You can see how the use of crushed stone, sand and gravel has grown from 62% of all materials in 1950 to 75% in the year 2000. Just think, three-fourths of all materials used are aggregates. I wouldn't have believed this before I began researching this subject. And this is in the US, where a large proportion of residential houses are built with wood rather than concrete. Now do remember that these are weight comparisons. A graph or pie chart for the values of various materials will look very different. The value of the iron and steel industry alone is estimated to have been over 1.5 trillion in 1919, compared with the value of sand and aggregates of 70 billion dollars. So the value of sand is less than 5% of the value of iron and steel. My own guess is that considering the alarming extent of illegal mining of sand from riverbeds, which has become so widespread around the world, the figure of 70 billion dollars is probably a gross underestimate. But it would still be a very tiny fraction of the value of steel production. As economies have grown, the use of sand in so many different building and construction projects and a growing number of industrial and consumer products is now resulting in the over-exploitation of this natural resource and threatening environmental disasters, like floods. The extraction of sand from rivers causes them to overflow their banks when there are heavy rains and to flood surrounding areas often bringing untold misery and death to human and animal life. Extracting sand from rivers with the help of shovels, pumps or excavators is easy and cheap and the increasing demand for sand has resulted in over-extraction. This has resulted in changes in the flow of water in rivers and brought floods and disaster to, to adjoining lands. Approximately 40 billion tons of sand and gravel are mined annually and the bulk of it is used by the construction industry. With the growth in world population and the resultant need for more houses, demand for sand has increased steeply. So what do the sand merchants do? 
they extract more and more sand from the rivers and they keep doing this even after governments ban the mining of, of river sand. This sand mining activity has begun to take a heavy toll on the areas where the rivers are mined and further downstream, a heavy toll in the form of floods. The gap between demand and supply of construction grade sand worldwide has been widening alarmingly. Governments have been compelled to restrict sand mining from riverbeds. The result is that the, the availability of river sand is slowly diminishing and the alternative means of producing sand are increasing the cost of this input, creating risks for many industries worldwide. A United Nations Environment Programme report of 2019 talks of how twice the amount of sand is mined than is freshly brought down by all the rivers of the world. In other words, there is massive over-exploitation of this resource, resulting in its steady depletion. According to the UNEP report, sand, gravel, crushed stone and aggregates, known together as sand resources, are the second most exploited natural resource in the world after water. The report points out that sand use has tripled in the last two decades to reach an estimated 40 to 50 billion metric tons per year, driven by factors such as urbanization, population growth, economic growth and climate change. If the recklessness with which sand is being extracted from the land and from the rivers and creeks is not brought under control soon, we are inviting major disasters in the near future. Because it is created through the constant erosion of rocks around the world, sand is theoretically a renewable resource. Certainly as long as the rivers continue to flow and bring the mountain debris down with them, rolling and rubbing and scraping it to create sand. But we need to remember that the transformation of rocks to sand and gravel has taken millions of years and we cannot expect it to be replenished at the rate at which humanity is using it up. People and governments have begun to understand the seriousness of this issue and voluntary as well as official organizations have begun to resist the reckless mining of sand. Now one question that may pop into your mind, it did with me, is okay there is a problem with over exploitation of river sand but with so much sand around the world, in the deserts on every continent and on beaches along every sea, why should there be a problem? The problem with sea sand is that it has too much of salts which absorb moisture from the atmosphere and cause permanent dampness in any structure that uses such sand, even in a mixture with cement. Okay, so that's that. But why can't we use desert sand? There are billions of acres of desert sand in the world. The Sahara Desert alone is over 9.2 million square miles in area and if you add the next nine biggest deserts including the Great Australian, the Arabian, the Gobi, the Kalahari, the Patagonian Desert, the Syrian Desert, the Great Basin, Chihuahuan Desert and the Karakum Desert, you get a total of nearly 19 million square miles of desert. That is about the same size as the entire United States of America and China combined. Wonderful. But all that desert sand is useless for the purpose of making concrete or glass. The problem with desert sand is that most of it is not made up of silicates, the material you get from quad sand. Quad sand is the sand used in the building and construction industry, in the manufacture of glass and in a variety of other things including semiconductor chips. There are two reasons why the vast seas of sand we call deserts are mostly useless for making concrete. One where it is silica, the particles have been so eroded by wind and friction of sand against sand that the particles have become rounded. Such rounded particles do not have the necessary adhesive properties to make concrete because they are unable to lock into one another. They slip and that weakens the concrete. And two, and more important, much of this sand happens to be gypsum, which has a mere 2% of the hardness that quartz particles have. So quartz sand, which is found in abundance in rivers, is the material used in concrete, not gypsum. Gypsum is too soft to give a building the structural strength it requires. However, gypsum is widely used not in constructing walls but in plastering them and has been used thus for a very long time. Plaster made from gypsum is a white material that hardens as it dries and is mostly used to cover walls and ceilings. It can be used on concrete, brick or stone walls. Why is it used? Basically because it gives a much smoother look and feel than if the walls expose the concrete, brick or stone that they are made of. Take a look. 
Here are particles of river sand and you can see how the particles are jagged and of all shapes and sizes which is what enables them to adhere together with the help of cement. Hence the making of concrete requires sand from the rivers. Now the problem today as we have seen earlier is that there is over exploitation of river sand and that is causing not just the faster depletion of this vital resource, it is also causing disasters by distorting river courses. But we need sand for building construction and for making glass. So if you have to curtail mining of river sand, then one method by which we can get more sand is to crush rocks. This method of crushing rocks is being adopted in many places and is adding to the supply of sand and gravel. But as you can imagine, it is more expensive than what it costs to just take your truck to the riverside and scoop up all the sand you want free of cost. The sand used to make glass is made up of small quartz crystals composed of silicon dioxide molecules, also known as silica. When sand is heated to a very high temperature, it melts and loses its original structure. And as it cools, it has a very different structure. So in a basic sense, glass is sand that has been melted and chemically transformed. But it is not only sand that is used in this process. At least a couple of other substances are used. Usually these are soda ash, that is sodium carbonate and limestone or calcium carbonate or dolomite, which is magnesium carbonate. When sand is heated to a temperature of around 2000 degrees centigrade, it melts and is chemically transformed. Adding sodium carbonate helps to bring the melting point down to 1000 degrees centigrade. Now see how the use of glass in buildings has grown over the last century. Can you see the difference in these pictures in how much glass has been used in construction? Here is a building in Kansas City built around 1890. It's all stone and brick. The windows are small and therefore so is the use of glass. And here is one also in Kansas City built in the 1980s. See how much more glass has been used in the newer building. Can you see the difference here? Again, you can see how the new World Trade Center built at the same site as the old one is all glass and steel. Can you see the difference? The structure is made of stone and the windows are small and so is the use of glass. Can you see the difference here too? At first glance, the situation seems utterly hopeless. If you cannot use sand to make concrete, how can you build buildings for offices and homes? Well, some people might ask, why is that a problem? Construct new offices and houses with wood. Now that may seem a reasonable response in America or in some parts of Europe, but not in most other parts of the world where you do not have such large forests with enough trees to cut for timber to build houses. The United Nations Environment Program appointed a group of world experts from all sectors to propose 10 solution-oriented recommendations to deal with the impending sand crisis. These were the 10 recommendations. One, recognize sand as a strategic resource. Two, include place-based perspectives for just sand transitions. Three, enable a paradigm shift to a regenerative and circular future. Four, integrate policy and legal frameworks strategically. Five, establish ownership and access to sand resources through mineral rights and consenting. Six, map, monitor and report sand resources. Seven, establish best practices, national standards and a coherent international framework. Eight, promote resource efficiency and circularity. Nine, source responsibly. 10. Restore ecosystems and compensate remaining losses. These resolutions are very good, but good resolutions do not solve crises. We need action by governments as well as voluntary organizations and the corporate sector too to implement the resolutions. Until now, while some voluntary groups have taken the initiative to draw public attention to the crisis, they do not have the power to implement change. We need companies to act because they are the ones involved with the processes related to building and construction and projects of all kinds. And we need governments to ensure that the good resolutions are implemented. I hope you like this story on the sand crisis. We are going to upload more videos on business and economic history over the coming weeks and months. So do visit us again and tell your friends and colleagues too. And if you have not already subscribed to the Business History channel, please do so.
for then you will be alerted every time we upload a new video here. Do also visit our website bh.domainb.com to get a lot more content on business history including lists of books and book reviews, people, some fun tidbits and a business history quiz. From there, you will also get access to a wide range of business news and content on InfoMachine, the web-based business intelligence and knowledge management system that finds, tracks and downloads relevant news from your selected sources, saving you hours of grind and toil. It's free of cost. The product links are given below in the description to the video. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you with our next video. Until then, goodbye.